Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zach's. I'm your host, Ben Rains, and today we're taking a look at what to do with Lululemon stock after they reported their first quarter earnings results. And then we're going to take a look at what to do with Nike stock ahead of its upcoming earnings results that are due out later this week. And so we're going to see what their, the coronavirus is doing to both of these stocks. But before we get into everything, I want to say remember, if you have any questions or episode suggestions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. Also, make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. And make sure to check out our new zax.com slash promo page for a look into some of our services, portfolios, and more. So before we jump into Lululemon and then Nike, I quickly want to just give up sp- somewhat simple market overview. So all three major U.S. indexes posted weekly gains of at least 1.7% last week, which came a week after that big Thursday sell-off where the Dow fell almost 7% and you had the NASDAQ and the S&P down big as well. So the climb continues to be driven by the Fed stimulus efforts alongside the continued reopening of the U.S. economy in the more broad global economy. And clearly, there have been headlines that are starting to pop up over the last week or two about more and more coronavirus cases climbing in states that have ended their lockdowns or slowly rolled back their lockdown measures. And we had news breaking last Friday that Apple was closing stores in four states related to a rise in coronavirus cases. So those four states are Florida, Arizona, and then both of the Carolinas. But investors should note that the iPhone giant has already taken a more cautious approach than some of the other retailers in reopening its stores. And it's only closing roughly a dozen stores across those four states. So this is something clearly to keep paying attention to if any other retailers follow Apple's suit in some of these states that are seeing more cases. But what we do know is that May's May's retail sales came in far better than expected. Uh, The sales surged roughly 18% from April. According to the Commerce Department, this crushed economist surveyed by the Wall Street Journal who were calling for about a 7.7% bounce. So 18% versus what they were calling for about an 8% bounce. And that climb represented the largest monthly increase on record dating all the way back to 1992. The numbers also highlighted the pandemic's likelihood that the worst economic days are already behind us because we saw non-essential segments of the retail industry, such as furniture, up pretty big. So this brings me to Lululemon, which reported its Q1 results on Thursday, June 11th. So before we look at its first big coronavirus quarter and then what to expect going forward, it's worth just quickly jumping back to give people a better sense of what to do with the stock. So shares of Lululemon had skyrocketed over the last few months heading into its earnings report, despite the fact that many of its stores were closed due to the coronavirus. So Lululemon in mid-March closed what it said called a majority of its stores globally outside of greater China as part of the closure of countless other businesses that were deemed non-essential. So Lululemon followed suit of all those other companies. And then amid these closures, they still continued to run their e-commerce business. And then if we jump ahead to May 21st, the company announced that it was gradually welcoming back guests to select locations were permitted to do so. So the athleisure retailer said it had already reopened in greater China and was currently working to reopen on a market by market basis in accordance with local government and public health authority guidelines. So at the time, so this was on May 21st, Lululemon said that it had already opened over 150 locations across North America, Europe, Asia, New Zealand, and Australia, which is where a majority of its nearly 500 and this is as of the end of the fourth quarter, stores are located. The company also said at the time that it was planning on opening roughly 200 additional locations over the next several weeks. So this brings me to its recently reported Q1 of fiscal 2020 results. So Lululemon's revenue fell about 17% to $652 million for the three-month period that was ended on May 3rd. So it includes March, April, and then the first couple of days of May, which is a big chunk of the coronavirus lockdown period. This came in far below our Zach's estimate. And it also marked its the company's first year-over-year revenue decline since the fourth quarter of 2009. And it represented a sharp drop from recent periods of about 20% or higher sales expansion. 
And then on the bottom line, its adjusted first quarter earnings fell about 70% to $0.22 cents per share, which also missed our estimate. On the positive side, the sportswear company's online business surged by 70% to account for about 55% of overall quarterly sales, which was up from about 27% of sales in the year-ago period, which makes obvious sense that their stores were closed, so people were buying all of their Lululemon goods online. In looking ahead, CEO Calvin McDonald said that he expects the share of sales that are coming from e-commerce to remain what he said was permanently higher. With that said, Lululemon won't provide any financial guidance for the current year because of the uncertain economic climate that continues to hover around the coronavirus. And he also said that they do not expect to return to earnings growth until the fourth quarter. And then on the brick and mortar front, Lulu said that it had about 295 of its roughly 490 stores around the world reopened as of June 11th. And about half of the North American stores are now open and it expects all of its stores will be reopened by the end of June. And obviously there could be setbacks on that front as it's a fluid situation with these coronavirus cases spiking, quote unquote, in different areas. So now with this in mind, we're going to look ahead to what to expect going forward. And Lululemon has seen some positive earnings revision activity following its Q1 release especially for the fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 2021. So we've seen its outlook jump by about 11 cents for the full year, the current full year, and then another 11 cents for fiscal 2021. So some positivity on that end in terms of earnings revisions. This helps it earn a Zach's rank number two buy at the moment. And then if we look ahead to the actual growth percentages we're calling we're calling for a 7% decline in Q2 which would come in far better than previous quarters 17% decline and then if we're looking ahead all the way to Q3 we're calling for an actual bump from the year ago period so about a 4% jump and then overall we're still calling despite these coronavirus setbacks Lululemon's full year sales are expected to climb about 1.2% and then jump about 24% above that in fiscal 2021. This is based on our current year estimates where the company is then approaching that $5 billion revenue threshold in 2021. And then on the bottom line, we're calling for its adjusted earnings to slip about 50% in Q2. And then that figure is only expected to decline about 6% in Q3 and down about 11% on the year. And then a big bounce back in Q or in 2021 is expected with about 42% growth on the bottom line. So for reference for on the revenue side, as we mentioned, we're calling for about a 1.2% growth this year, and then another nearly 24% growth next year. This would compare relatively favorably to what they've done in the recent period. So in 2020, Twenty or so in 2019, their their sales were up 21 percent. The year before that, they were up 24 percent, and then 13 percent, and 14 percent, and 15 percent. So it's not like Lululemon had been doing 50 percent growth or anything like that. Just to give you some context, the the stock price has gone up with 24 percent growth being that biggest year over year jump they'd seen in the last five or six years. So them being able to do 24 percent growth in 2021. Uh, what's expected is a solid thing considering the current coronavirus downturn is expected to see them still jump about 1.2% this year above last year's impressive growth. So now let's talk a little bit more broadly about its appeal to Wall Street and its stock price movement. For those of you who don't know, Lululemon's success in that athleisure business has forced everyone from Gap in Victoria's Secret to Target to all roll out their own athleisure brands and push these styles that Lululemon helped popularize and its ability to expand both in the digital age and in the brick and mortar. Uh, its own brick and mortar business has helped it really grow. And then along with its successful women's athleisure and athletic offerings, the firm has pushed further into outerwear. It now hopes to compete against the likes of Canada Goose and the North Face. 
The company is also selling far more work appropriate style clothing, self care products. And then on top of that, the company expects to double the size of its menswear business by 2023. And then it also expects to more than double its digital revenues by 2023 and quadruple its international revenues by 2023 as well, which includes an expected massive push in Asia. So then on the stock price front, Lulu, Lulu was trading at about or right around all time highs heading into earnings and the stock currently rests about 8% off those highs. It was trading this morning at $302 per share. Uh, with the stock of about 1.5% through morning trading on Monday. And then if we, uh, overall, clearly the stock appears to be worth considering and some of people might be a little bit nervous buying it around those highs. But if you have a longer term investment horizon, you don't necessarily need to find the most precise entry point as avoiding the highs can also prevent you from maybe ever really buying so if you if you look at what lulu has done uh over the longer term so if you if you're going to buy on the longer term horizon you don't necessarily have to be as worried about buying near those highs because if you had already owned it and was hitting those highs you'd be happy as well and it's most likely uh, going to continue to go up in the longer term horizon given all of its ability to grow within this athleisure space that certainly doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon so we're going to close out with Lulu by just looking at some of its stock price performance and then some of its valuation compared to Nike to give investors a better sense of these two companies. So since March 23rd, which was the market's bottom at this point, Lululemon stock is up 71%, about 70%. This outpaces the apparel market's 53% climb and Nike's about 55% jump. And then if we look to so far in 2020, Lululemon's up about 27% compared to its broader industries, about 13% decline and Nike 6% decline over the stretch in 2020. And then if we look over the last 12 months, Lululemon stocks up about 60% compared to Nike's 12% and its industry is about 3% decline. So you can sense a theme here. And then if we look over the last three years, Lululemon stock is up about 460% compared to Nike's 85% and its industry's 50%. So Lululemon up 460% over the last three years, Nike at 85 and its industry at 50. So you can see just how strong Lululemon stock has been over the last three years. And then on the valuation side, Lululemon's currently trading at a pretty, pretty extended valuation. It's trading at 68.6 times trailing 12-month earnings, and that's about double uh, Nike's 33.3 times trailing 12 months earnings. And then if we look at in terms of price to sales, if we look at trailing 12 months, Lululemon's trading at about 10.3 times compared to Nike's 3.8 times. So that valuation is stretched, but people have been willing to pay up for Lululemon's growth story. And obviously, they're at far different periods in their company's growth cycle when we're looking at Lululemon versus Nike. So now we're going to go ahead and see what to expect from Nike and what to maybe do with the stock before it reports its earnings later. So Nike stock has outpaced, as we just sort of alluded to, the S&P 500's climb from its March 23 lows up about 55%. The sportswear giant stores are up and running again in China, and they're slowly starting to reopen elsewhere. So now let's kind of dive into what to expect from its fourth quarter fiscal 2020 financial results that are due out on Thursday, June 25th. So like with Lulu and Apple, and many other retailers, it closed its stores in mid-March in an effort to combat the spread of the coronavirus. Nike stores remained closed far longer than it initially expected and most people initially expected. The company then did release a statement on May 14th, updating Wall Street about its store reopening plans 
Nike said at the time that 100% of Nike-owned stores and over 95% of partner stores in Greater China and South Korea were open, with some still operating with reduced hours. The company also noted that in these markets, retail traffic trends are progressing, and while physical store traffic remains below uh, prior year levels, this is largely offset by higher conversion rates and continued strong digital demand. So they're seeing less traffic at these stores that had reopened in both China and South Korea. And then despite some positive news in China, Nike said at the time that product shipments to wholesale customers have slowed, resulting in significantly lower wholesale revenue and higher inventory. They also noted that uh, its operations in North America and elsewhere would be likely impacted pretty significantly in the fourth quarter due to uh, that Nike Direct and its wholesale business. And as of May 14th, only 5% of its stores in North America were open at that point. But as I mentioned, Nike has slowly started to reopen stores outside of China in South Korea since then. And we'll obviously hear more about those reopenings and their near-term plans when they report their results on Thursday. And hold on. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at what to expect. So Nike's revenue, well, quickly. If we look back at last quarter, Nike's revenue jumped 5% last quarter with digital sales up about 36%. But we should note that these results captured the three-month period that ended on February 29th, which means it didn't really include any coronavirus impact outside of China. So if we look ahead now, our estimates are calling for Nike's Q4 fiscal 2020 sales to plummet about 27.4% from the year-ago period with its adjusted earnings expected to tumble about 95% to three cents per share. So we're calling from a, they reported 62 cents per share on an adjusted basis last year, and we're calling for three cents and then a 27.4% decline to about 7.4 billion. And then we're expecting their Q1 sales to decline about 4.5% and then a about a 26% decline on the bottom line. And then in terms of its full year sales are projected to sink about 2%, which is expected to lower its full year adjusted earnings by about 17%. So obviously the coronavirus, its impact in China and elsewhere is expected to impact Nike pretty greatly this fiscal year, which is ending at the moment. They're about to report their Q4 fiscal 2020. So if we look ahead to that next year, we're calling for their revenue to bounce back by about 8.3% and their adjusted earnings to climb by about 24%, which would both come in above uh, the previous year's growth as well. And then if we look at its negative earnings revisions activity, that helps Nike hold a Zach's rank number four sell at the moment. The company is also part of our shoes and retail apparel, apparel excuse me, industry that sits in the bottom 6% of our more than 250 Zach's industry. So with this in mind, some investors might not want to bet on a strong post earnings climb from Nike, especially since the stock had already hit new all-time highs in early June. With that said, though, longer-term investors might want to consider Nike. It still pays a dividend. Uh, its yield comes in at about 1% right now, which is above the 10-year U.S. Treasuries, about 0.7%. You could also argue that Nike, despite Lululemon's climb and Adidas' ascent in North America, is more influential in both the U.S. and North America and around the world than ever before, both on the field and off the field in terms of style and appeal. And we should also note that e-commerce still only accounts for about 12% of total U.S. retail sales. And this is as of the first quarter. So Nike still has, obviously, along with the broader retail industry, miles to grow in terms of this, their direct-to-consumer business, which should help them in the long run. And at the moment, Nike stock jumped another 3% through morning trading on Monday to about $98.50 per share. So that was about $6 off its highs, which could mean that Wall Street is expecting good things from Nike. And obviously, 
it's it's always a little dangerous to buy stocks betting on near term post earnings, uh, either gains or losses. So longer term investors might want to consider either of these stocks despite these near term coronavirus setbacks. But playing Nike for a, a post earnings jump is a little risky as always, especially amid this continued coronavirus uncertainty, because you never know what's going to happen with these stores as maybe things start to spike back up in China and the US. The, the uncertainty is a little high in the near term, but both stocks do appear to be solid longer term investments in the broader retail space within this athleisure and sportswear market. So that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.